Welcome. And thank you so much for joining the New America Fellows Program and the Political Reform Program for this discussion of Ted Johnson's When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America. I'm Sarah Boleen, the Senior Program Associate for the Fellows Program. And for more than 20 years, New America has supported hundreds of fellows who have gone on to publish books, produce documentary films and other deeply reported projects. And we're so grateful to be able to host this event today and welcome Ted for such a timely and necessary conversation about race in America. Before we start, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you do have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll pass them on to our moderator. And if you need closed captioning, please click the CC button on the bottom menu bar. We also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and our events list so you can learn more about our work as well as receive invitations to future fellows programming events. You can find that information on our website. And most importantly, copies of When the Stars Begin to Fall are available for purchase through our bookselling partner, Solid State Books. You can find a link to buy the book on the event page. Now, let me introduce you to today's speakers. Ted Johnson is a senior fellow and director of the Fellows Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law, where he undertakes research on race, politics, and American identity. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, he was a national fellow at New America and a commander in the United States Navy, where he served for 20 years in a variety of positions, including as a White House fellow in the first Obama administration and as a speechwriter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Anne-Marie Slaughter is joining us as the moderator today. Anne-Marie is the CEO of New America. She's also the Bert G. Kerstetter 66 University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. From 2009 to 2011, she served as Director of Policy Planning for the United States Department of State, the first woman to hold that position. Upon leaving the State Department, she received the Secretary's Distinguished Service Award for her work, leading the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, as well as meritorious service awards from USAID and the Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. We're so pleased to have you both here with us today. Thank you for joining us. And I'll turn the conversation over to Anne-Marie. Sarah, thank you. And welcome to all of you. Uh, I am really excited uh, to be having this conversation. I have been waiting for this book to come out for months. I had the privilege of seeing uh, a fairly early draft and loved it and have already been citing it uh, really several times in print before this book, it, the book has come out. So uh, it just gives me great pleasure to see it in print and to be able to have this conversation with Ted. So Ted, I think we, let, let's begin by, uh, I'm just gonna ask you to talk a little bit about the book uh, and sort of give you a chance to frame it the way you wanna frame it. And then we will jump into a conversation and then we'll turn it over to all of your questions. If you have a question uh, as we're talking, just, just put it in the uh, Q and A. Excellent, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. And, uh, and thanks to New America, not just for this event, but for helping me conceive this book in the first place. I was just retiring from the military, had just finished a doctorate, and was looking at a mid-career transformation to think more deeply about race and politics. And all I had was an idea and a dissertation, but the New America Fellows Program helped me take that stuff and turn it into a book proposal and get it, get it in front of agents, which is, has allowed this moment to, to come to be. So without the New America Fellows Program, this I don't know that this project would exist. So thank you for that investment and the, the resources you, you provided me to do so. Um, so the book, look, it's, um, it's I call it a three-legged stool of three-legged stools. It's, it's a bunch of puzzle pieces taken from my personal and family narrative, from political science and philosophy and sociology, and smashing them all together to paint a picture where bits of it may feel familiar to us, but the picture um, as a whole is something I, I hope feels fresh and new and uh, offers some um, you know, ideas to debate and hopefully we can, we can implement. So uh, I'll sort of tackle the big themes of the book. Uh, the first is that racism is an existential threat to America. And I make this declaration uh, and I, I say to America and not to the United States because I want to distinguish between the geopolitical entity we know as the United States, which is governed by its interests and not by you know 
a moral compass or, or an absolute sense of right and wrong, but national interest. And then America, which I think is the idea on which the nation was founded and the, the, the principles, the promise of America, which is that we are all created equal and that we have unalienable rights to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I think the project of our country is making the United States, the nation state, live up to America, the ideals. And we've not yet closed the gap, but this is the, the project that's before us and, and has been for generations and will be for generations to come. So racism is a threat to the American idea to the promise of America because it undermines the things we say we hold true and, and, and the things we value like equality and like liberty. The second bit of this is that national solidarity is the way to mitigate or overcome the effects of racism. I don't know that we'll ever get rid of racism completely. I, I actually think we will not, but I think we can reduce the impact that racism has on our lives and on our country if we proactively tackle the challenges it, it raises. And national solidarity is, uh, this is another one of those concepts that, that borrows from lots of academic scholarship um, and, and thinks about civic solidarity and political solidarity and social solidarity. I define national solidarity as the bond of affection between citizens who are holding the state accountable for being in breach of the social contract and not being in breach because it's not provided material uh, gains or, or delivered on material demands to the people, but because it is not delivered on the moral claims that the people have on the state. That is to ensure equality, to ensure that our constitutional rights are not infringed upon. So we are, it's national solidarity is when people bond together over a cause that is moral and just and hold the state accountable for being in breach of the social contract. The third leg of this stool is that Black America provides a model for this national solidarity. It is not that Black America exclusively holds the key to the future, but that the history of Black people in this country provides lessons, highlights attributes of how to construct a solidarity out of nothing, out of, out of bad experiences and out of a desire for something more, and then compel the nation to be better than it is in hopes that we can close that gap between the United States and America, between who we say we are, who we profess to be, and then how we actually behave and what our actions actually say about who we are. Wow. There are so much I want to talk about. <laughs> There's so many uh, fabulous ideas. I'm going to pull, I'm going to ask you to pull the lens back just a bit, and then I want to come back directly to solidarity, because I do think, I think that's a, a, a very important and original contribution to the national debate. So I'm, I'm going to come back to it. But I have to start by saying, when the stars begin to fall, it's such a poetic title. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? And why did you choose it? Yeah, so it comes from, it's it's a song from a, an old Negro spiritual, you know, the songs that enslaved Black people used to sing during slavery. Uh, I, came, I came across it first in uh, W.E. Du Bois' book, The Soul of Black Folks, and he talks about the, the seven, uh, I think it's the seven sorrow songs, and yeah. this is one of them. Um, so When the Stars Begin to Fall is a song that is ostensibly a Christian song, about when the rapture happens and sort of when people ascend uh -huh. to heaven and um, enslaved people would sing this in the field as they try to manage this very hard life. But what it is actually about is emancipation. But they couldn't sing explicitly about their desire to break free of this institution. So they often cloaked their desire for liberty, for freedom, for emancipation, and Christian themes which were permitted. So when the stars begin to fall is um, sort of it has dual meanings. And I sort of I, I take that into the book to say that uh, when the stars begin to fall, as in the stars on our flag, um, you know, is have we achieved the nation where the stars are falling into place? Or have we created a nation where the stars are sort of falling out of the sky and collapsing on ourselves as we have lost the promise of America by not living up to our values? I love that. So, so let me then come, come to um, the point about solidarity and then specific, and specifically, so you defined it as the bonds between people uh, as they're holding their government to account. So I wanna ask you 
you know, to give us some examples of, of what that looks like in practice. And then I also want to talk about why specifically Black solidarity. But, but start with, it's not a deeply American concept, right? Uh, you know, in Europe and in Africa, there are other cultures where that are much more solid, solidarist, I guess you'd say, or just a prize solidarity. You hear movements in the United States talk about solidarity, and of course, that was the name of the Polish anti-communist movement. Right. But it's—you uh, can look at a lot of American documents, and that's not the word you'd see. So, just talk a little bit more about what it means, what it looks like in practice. Yeah. So, in yeah. practice, um, solidarity is not just unity. It's not the kind of rally around the flag that we feel after we've been attacked, say in Pearl Harbor or 9-11. Or um, solidarity requires sacrifice of everyone. Um, to be in solidarity with someone is not to be in agreement with them, is not to stand in unity with them, but is to be willing to sacrifice something in your life so that the, the cause or the person you're standing in solidarity with is helped as a result. So you're right that this is not something, uh, one, the concept of solidarity is not unique to America, but I would argue it's maybe more difficult to find in America because of our history and because we are a nation of 330 million people from different races, ethnicities, religions, languages, customs, cultures, there's nothing about us that is homogenous. And it is incredibly difficult, and all of the scholarships suggest this, to build bonds of solidarity between uh, a diverse people and especially in a large um, society. So this is why the project is so difficult, but this is why it is also so powerful because if we can find the solidarity, if we can create bonds of affection between people who only share a belief in the American idea, that's the only thing that connects them aside from the, the legal um, uh, obligations of citizenship, then uh, we have, will have created something new, a multiracial democracy where people across difference stand in solidarity with one another. Now, this could mean when it comes to voting, if some groups are left out of um, having access to the ballot and you stand in solidarity with that group, that doesn't mean you just write your congressman a letter and then go off and do your own thing. It means you almost force the democracy to pause, force government to stop and take notice that some people, even if it's not you, are being, their rights are being infringed upon. Solidarity means giving up your time, your resources to ensure that the principles you all say you hold dear are, are the things that actually govern how, how you live and, and what you believe. So really a kind of leaving no one behind, right? That I could exactly. speed ahead, but I'm going to tell my government stop uh, until we bring everyone with us. It's interesting, I was just thinking, it, it, if you think about you know the French Revolution and the American Revolution and the, the different, kind of docu founding documents. And of course, the United States is much more individual, right? Every man, mm -hmm. every human is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the French, of course, are liberty, uh, equality, and fraternity, right? Yeah. Which you never have in the United States. But you're, uh, you're right, of course, the French nation is far more, or was far more homogeneous, much less, less so today. But mm -hmm. um, so that concept that of, of a bond that requires that you share something and that you give up something uh, to stand with with your fellows. So in chat, I think in chapter six, one of your chapters, you say black solidarity. Mm. So is, talk about what that means specifically uh, in terms of of both why black solidarity, black solidarity, and what the African-American community or the Black community has, has to, to teach the rest of us? Yeah, so Black solidarity is, um, one, it's, it's a novel creation. I, like it's, I think too many in the nation um, consider the unity seen among Black folks, one, as a kind of political unity because 90% of Black people will vote for Democrats in congressional presidential elections, but they treat it as if solidarity is innate. You know, you're sort of, it's in the melanin in your skin that you will also bond with other black people and it happens naturally. But it, 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 when we look back to 1619 coming forward, the black people that arrived in the United States were not homogenous. Uh, they were from different customs, cultures, religions, dialects, languages from different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. And they were mashed together under the, the boot of slavery, under, under the lash to become a new people. And so the African-American was created from a diverse set of African people who were subjected to slavery. 
So the solidarity that was created in this, this mashing together was one, a survival mechanism, but it is also, it, it is so um, ingrained in the Black American experience because of our history that it finds new ways of expression, um, both political and civic in particular. But in this chapter in the book, I'm talking about the social aspect of the solidarity. And social solidarity is, a, I, I take the definition from a scholar, uh, her name is Sally Scholes, and she talks about this kind of solidarity being one that you're born into, a group that you don't self-select into, but one that you are assigned or by happen by um, virtue of some incident, you know, you, you become a part of. So there are solidarity among like breast cancer survivors. There tends to be solidarity among those who have just suffered a national uh, or a natural disaster or solidarity among family members. We don't choose our parents more times than not. We don't choose to be victims of natural disasters. We don't choose our illnesses, but we find bonds of connection with people because of the shared family history or because of a shared experience. And so black solidarity for all of its political and civic ramifications is really about being born into this group that is now subjected by, by no fault of any group members, uh, no fault of their own, a particular experience in this country that requires that they bond together if any one of them is going to have access to the full rights and privileges of citizenship that the nation is supposed to guarantee. So it's not just political action. It's not just uh, making demands of the state, but it's, so, it is the, um, the group membership and the willing to, and your, the understanding that your fate is linked to those of, of others in the group. Um, that's the kind of social solidarity that I think Americans, we could sort of scale out and Americans could adapt if we had that common set of beliefs, um, because certainly there's not a common set of American experiences uh, given how large and diverse we are. So I wanna I shift ground to the personal for a minute. I, as you're talking about you know, imagining the spread of that solidarity, I'm with you. I mean, I, I so, both see and hope that we can achieve a country that really that finds solidarity transracially, transethnically, trans all our, our our differences. But I can hear my husband and many other more cynical people in my life saying, "Oh, come on, you know that that's just pie in the sky." I wonder to what extent your own experience and your focus on solidarity is connected to your experience in the military. Because obviously the military in many ways it depends on achieving that solidarity. We leave no soldier behind, right? Fight for one another, fight. So talk a little bit about the extent to which you think the, the appeal of the concept is linked to your own personal experiences. Yeah, it's deeply connected. And um, I, I think uh, part of the issue with race we have today um, never mind the history and the public policy implication, those sorts of things. But we can't talk about racism honestly in this country because we have self-segregated um, socioeconomically and racially throughout much of the country. If you look at the schools our kids go to, if you look at the neighborhoods that we live in, it's often more people like us and not lots of diversity and difference there. And so when you are when you are self-segregated in such a large society, um, the stereotypes and caricatures of others who you don't come in contact with are easier to believe and they take root much more um, easily because what experience do you have, what knowledge do you have to sort of controvert the thing that's being sold to you? So what the military does is it forces Americans who would never meet one another in any other instance to now work together for a common mission. And it doesn't mean that you suddenly believe the same or that you, you know, you begin to like love one another and, and sort of skip off into the sunset together, but it means that you are willing to, um, to extend grace to people who are different from you, who believe differently from you, who have different ideas about what should happen because you recognize their fundamental humanity, the dignity, but also that they kind of want the same thing out of the whole project that you want. They just disagree on the best way to get there. And so much of what plagues our country today, and we can look, we, we've got folks in Congress and, and at the states talking about critical race theory and wanting to defund schools and tear up school districts that talk about anti-racism or structural racism or white supremacy or the Confederacy. And, and the words become more important than the people. 
And the words are used to divide us and not to try to bring us together. And it's so easy to say those black university professors teaching this stuff to your kids or teaching you that white people are bad when you or your children don't know other people across the racial, the, across the color line. So it's easy to ascribe the worst to them because you've got no tangible experiences that would suggest that maybe that caricature is inaccurate. So I, I think, and one of the recommendations I make in the book is, a, is for a national service program to incentivize, if not compel Americans to get out of their bubbles and begin to form civic kinships, civic friendships with these democratic strangers we call our, our compatriots. Hmm. You know, the segregation point is so powerful. Paul Butler, our, our new president, uh, the president and chief transformation officer of New America, uh, asked early on when we were talking about race and equity and, and transformation, he said that one of the exercises he's used is to ask a group of people to think of the 10 people in their lives who are most important, right? You know, who are just your 10 essentials. Obviously your family is going to be there, some friends, and then ask how many of them are of a different race or ethnicity. Uh, and I will say, I think for most of my friends, certainly growing up, um, I think me, I think most of them would not ha have anybody in that top 10 who is of, a, of another race. And I think that's different for, for our children somewhat because America itself is becoming more diverse, but probably not, you know, if you would then add, add class in there and, and as you say, housing segregation, very little. So how are you going to see that other person as, you know, a, a parent, somebody with anxiety? So, you know, all the ways in which we are, we are human, but I, I, it's, it's very hard to, as you say, to, to see the people behind the politics. And yet ultimately right. Right. You, do, you do have to. And um, social media has exacerbated it. I mean, one would think that social media would introduce you to more people and you would have more perspectives. But again, more of the scholarship has shown that even our social, our social media circles are as segregated as our actual physical social circles. So if you look at people's Facebook feeds or their, um, their Twitter, you know, connections or followings, uh, they tend to look a lot like the people they talk to in real life. And so now we live in these mega bubbles and in these like really insulated um, echo chambers. And, uh, and they, um, the, the ideas and the connections that are formed in these chambers are strengthened. And if you're not part of that, you are now seen as the other way. And it's really easy to mobilize a group of people who feel connected against the others who none of them have any real connections to. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, we've, uh, I'm, I'm, we're going to be turning to audience uh, Q&A in 10 minutes. We've got a couple of questions already, but uh, by all means, put your questions uh, into the Q&A and, and I will see them and, we'll, and group them as, as best I can. Uh, so Ted, one of the other things I was struck by reading the book is you talk about uh, African Americans as superlative citizens, which I find a really wonderful description. And I will frame it by saying also that so often in the right-left divide, the right claims patriotism and citizenship and, you know, it really, the, those civic values and often it's rare that I think you'd hear people on the left of the, describing themselves as patriots uh, or, or even, even claiming this kind of idea of superlative citizenship. And it's certainly not how the right uh, sees the left or sees many uh, people of color. So talk about why you, you use that as a, a, a description of, of uh, superlative citizens. Yeah, so superlative citizenship is essentially a political strategy that exposes the breach between who a nation is and then who they are actually, uh, who they actually are based on their actions. Um, and so, what uh, what I say in the book basically is that African Americans have used superlative citizenship as a way of making a claim on the equality that is being denied to them by the state. And by superlative citizen, I mean uh, executing all of the duties, all of the excellencies of citizenship, even when the state doesn't 
deliver on its obligations to the citizens. So this is like uh, enslaved black people running off of plantations to fight in wars for our independence in the War of 1812 in the Civil War. And then certainly in the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 returned to slavery after the war was over as if their willingness to sacrifice their lives for independence and freedom wasn't enough for them to earn their own independence and freedom. And, and for those two wars, it certainly it, it wasn't. Um, this is um, uh, African-Americans going off to fight in World War I, II, Korea, uh, and then returning and not having full access to the GI Bill, which would allow them to buy a home or to the educational benefits, which would allow them to uh, pursue higher, you know, a college degree. And so the making of the middle class that the GI Bill, that the GI Bill uh, inspired or sort of fueled, Black folks were left out of, even though Many died uh, and, and bled and, and um, sacrificed in those wars. And not a single Medal of Honor was given to any Black service member for World War I and II until decades later when Bush, Clinton, and Obama retroactively looked at the citations for lesser medals and determined actually these were Medal of Honor worthy um, uh, ac actions. So th that is a kind of superlative citizenship. Another kind that I talk about that's fallen out of favor, frankly, uh, more recently, is the politics of respectability or respectability politics. Mm. This is the idea um, that you're, you know, dressing appropriately and having good etiquette and good diction forces people to recognize your humanity such that um, the denial of certain rights and privileges is no longer acceptable. And we know that it's never enough. You know, if you are if you are the wrong color in the wrong part of town, stopped by the wrong person. It doesn't matter if you have a doctorate or that you're a veteran or whatever. Sometimes your skin precedes the, the entire interaction and I can vouch for these things personally. Uh, but a century ago, it was a political strategy, mostly among church going black women who said, and these were women exposed to sexual violence, physical violence by work of being, by virtue of being domestics in many white households. So the politics of respectability, it kind of argued we can't be treated like animals if we dress appropriately, if we speak well, if we have all the manners and etiquette that this culture um, treasures. Uh, this is the civil rights movement. I mean, it is something to see black men and women in their Sunday best, sundresses, suits, being attacked by fire hoses and German shepherds. Who is the barbarian in these pictures? Who's the, who, which side is acting uncivilly? And that's hypocrisy, that, that mismatch of these people who don't have rights behaving civilly and these people who are agents of the state acting like animals is part of the power of the politics of respectability, which is writ large, the power of superlative citizenship. And the last thing I'll say is this is not exclusive to black people. Any group that's ever been marginalized, whether it's women, immigrants, you name it, Native Americans, superlative citizenship has often been a way that, they, that these groups make direct claims to have access to all the rights and privileges of citizenship, all of the constitutional rights by, um, by showing that not only do they want to belong, not only can they be a citizen, but that they can be exemplary citizens and the state not delivering on its end makes the state look like it's, uh, like it's the one that's behaving uncivilly. And then just to take it back to the way you described the, the three sort of broad art themes uh, of the book, uh, where you, then the, this idea of superlative citizens representing America, right, challenging right. United Statesians, right, or their fellow citizens to live up to the professed values of the country. So that it's, it's mm -hmm. like, whole, you know, the, claiming, actually act, believing and acting on those values in the face of those who are not, which is a, exactly. a, a to me, it is a very powerful move, uh, yeah. particularly at a time where, as I said, the left-right politics are, you know, often that's a fault line, the, the sort of wrapping yourself in the flag and the claims of patriotism. And this is, this is a way of saying, <laughs> we stand for the, for, for the, the promise, uh, right. the promise that, as you say in your title. So I, we have a couple of questions, again, keep them coming. I have a couple more, but I'm going to turn uh, to the audience. We have one from Vivian Nixon uh, who says, what are specific ways that perceptions of solidarity among blacks prevent civil discourse across a range of political views, given the emergence of cancel culture that is controlled by the most vocal 
sometimes polarized groups. How do we change that? And honestly, Ted, I remember your and my, one of our first conversations was sort of the compression of the space for black political discourse because of sort of the, the outside pressures. You know, I, honestly, I believe that if you, if we really had equality, you'd find as much diver political diversity among communities of color as you would among white communities communities or anybody else so there's that's a big question <laughs> it is it's a big question it's a hard one um and i my guess is my answer is probably not going to be that satisfying but here, here's where i'll say um one um usually black solidarity in practice when it's demonstrated is um experienced politically by the rest of the society uh, and so once you get out of places like barbershops and beauty salons and off of black twitter and just see how solidarity operates in the public sphere it looks like black people want the same party to dominate government um, what black solidarity is organized around is not in opposition to anything it's not black solidarity in opposition to white americans or, or in opposition to diversity it's not black sol solidarity in support of democrats it is black solidarity in support of civil rights in support of equality and so politics is the means to move a nation state from the way it's behaving to a way that's more racially progressive or a way that ensures civil rights protections are installed and then implemented. So this kind of solid, so here's the hard part about this is that it's easy uh, because of sort of how I, I set this up to look at black political solidarity and say all they want is for black people to get free money via reparations from the government. They don't actually wanna integrate. They still wanna to go to their HBCUs, but they just want the government to sort of take care of them. And they're not trying to integrate and be part of this larger project. And look at this anti-racism stuff and look at this critical race thing. They think we're all, white people are all racist and evil and are on the hook for everything bad that's happened to them. So it's easy to mobilize um, against black solidarity um, because it's it's easy to caricature, especially when you again when our, our social connections don't allow us to break down some of those those stereotypes. So I, I I don't know the answer of how to stop that caricaturing, except to say talk to folks who stand in solidarity with talk to black folks who stand in solidarity with other black folks, which is to say the vast majority of us. If you listen to the rhetoric of Tim Scott, black Republican from South Carolina, Cory Booker. Black Democrat Senator from New Jersey and Raphael Warnock, Black Senator from Georgia, mm -hmm. listen to them talk about their growing up. They almost always mention cotton and civil rights. Listen to them talk about education. They almost always talk about the importance of education for Black families, for poor communities, and the importance of equitably funding HBCUs. Um, they often talk about economic empowerment. Uh, they, they are co-sponsors on an anti-lynching bill that the Senate still can't seem to pass because of, of one or two Republicans. So this is the kind of solidarity that is on exhibit every day for us at the national level. And yet all we ever hear because of rhetoric that all these men also say is where they're divided. And um, which is goes to show that there's not a political um, uh, unanimity in, in Black America, that there's lots of diversity and lots of differing ideas, but on the basic question of equality and on um, the uh, expansion of opportunity and prosperity for Black communities, that solidarity is just as present among Black Democrats and Republicans as it is um, within this bubble of Black solidarity that we typically, typically ascribe to. Um, so uh, hopefully that does some justice to the question um, I'll leave it That's, uh, that is really interesting because as you were talking I was thinking so in some ways you know many of the the I mean voting rights bills the the, the, the uh, that many Democrats want to see get through would be probably better advantaged by more black Republicans than by more black Democrats in the right. sense of actually thinking about what do you need to cross party lines. That's a, that's quite interesting. Yeah. And, and frankly, it's it's happened. Um, you know, Tim Scott has been trying to get the Walter Scott Notification Act passed, which is, you know, a black man shot in the back in North Charleston by a white cop who then lied and said uh, he dropped his taser by the guy and said he was trying to take my taser. I had Oh, I remember, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and Tim Scott offered a criminal justice reform bill, but of course he wanted to exclude qualified immunity, whereas the Democrats wanted to include it. And but where the ninety percent of places where Black people across political ideologies agree, that's not sensational enough. Uh, sensational enough to um, 
to report on. And so it's the, yeah. the five percent or ten percent of things where they disagree. And frankly, uh, because all of these men in, in this example are good partisans, they sort of hew the party line. They kind of make it easy for um, for us to, to point to the to the divisions and mm -hmm. suggest that there's a black solidarity. And then there are those black people who don't want any part of it and be, would be willing to undermine the whole thing in service of partisan gain. <laughs> So we have a related question from Rachel Walsh, who says, how can we achieve national solidarity in a country that celebrates diverse and often opposing ways of thinking, which is the, the question of the day? Yeah, it, it's hard. And so there's two quick things I'll say on this. One is, if we look at the summer of last year, of 2020, I've started calling it the summer of solidarity. And it may be uh, a little hokey, um, but... If we think about how the nation came together after the murder of George Floyd, which came right on the heels of public knowledge about Ahmaud Arbery being killed by white vigilantes in Georgia and Breonna Taylor, the, her 911 call um, being killed by police and during a no-knock a, a, um, no search warrant, that all comes to the fore around May uh, or so, late April, and, and then certainly George Floyd in May. That's also when the nation is now under stay at home orders or social distancing or being sequestered in their homes because of the coronavirus pandemic. It's also when a lot of people are losing their jobs because coronavirus has hurt the economy. The, the government has not responded forcefully enough and um, people are now wondering where their economic security is. And we're debating about masks and vaccines and the legitimacy of science and the CDC. And then George Floyd is killed and we get a summer where people in every state in the union and territories uh, across lines of race, generation, party lines, uh, ideological lines, regions coming together every day for months on end to protest um, Floyd's murder. But what I think was actually happening where people were dissatisfied with agents of the state abusing their power, with the government not being responsive enough quickly enough uh, to the coronavirus pandemic. And people were longing for connection to one another and after being stuck in their homes and doing everything mm -hmm. on computers or, or no engagement at all. And so um, we got a taste of what national solidarity could look like that summer, last summer. And then a presidential election happens with a sitting president who uh, traffics in division as a way of winning um, as a way of strategic electoral politics. So a way of holding on to power is to set Americans against one another. And the year ends with the highest voter participation rate in the nation in 120 years, which is another example of how this solidarity we felt over the summer turned into action. And then January 6 happens. It's just a backlash to that solidarity. It's sort of a, a way of undermining connection across difference. So um, I think we've got a taste of it. It was too thin to endure, but we got a, a sample of it. What is the thing that can connect us uh, going forward that can be maybe thicker? Uh, I talk about the concept of American civil religion in the book. Yeah. And this is as old as Rousseau, but was sort of brought back to into modernity by the sociologist at Berkeley um, named Robert Bella in 67. And he basically says that there's a quasi-religious way of being an, an American, of sort of a civic exercise that feels religious at times. We have our pantheons with George Washington and Lincoln and, and King. We've got our, our, our sacred text in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence. We've got um, our sort of uh, our exemplary citizens and uh, our, our, our rituals with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. And we've got our symbols like the flag and the Statue of Liberty, all the marks of, of religion we have in our civic life. And that is the thing that has to be the, bond, the basis for our connection, our values, and then a demonstration of our belief in those values. It's very difficult and easily hijacked um, because some, one side claims the flag for themselves and, and uh, to, to the exclusion of the other side. That is a harmful practice of civil religion that we're more likely to see, but a purer version of it, I think, can be one that is could be the basis for a, um, a, a real thick national solidarity that could uh, hold the state to account and create, create connections across difference. So that's a great answer, and but I'm going to push harder uh, because we have another question uh, from Ahmed El Tamimi, uh, who says, "What do we need to do to change this environment of racism and establish solidarity within the nation?" And I want to sharpen that to say specifically with 
the next generation. You write about your own son uh, in the in in the book, and I've talked to many of my colleagues, uh, white and black, and uh, other folks of color, who say, you know, um, who can talk as you just talked about the promise of the country, about the you know the values, uh, and yet many folks, and I'll, I'll include folks of my 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 uh, children's friends don't they just see the hypocrisy mm -hmm. right they when you say the flag and the pledge of allegiance what they're seeing is the deep racism uh that accompanies those things uh and so when we sing you know the the national anthem francis scott key is you know the land of the free and the home of the brave and he's a, he you know he he's a slaveholder right. so how do you reconcile that how do we recognize the racism and yet hold to the values at the same time or or overcome it or change it is the question is right yeah so um uh, multiple parts here and I'll, I'll be more concise the, the first is that since our inception um we have been a paradox we, we were the nation that said all men are created equal and then we enslaved people as we signed the papers saying that we're all created equal and yet abraham lincoln hijacked the language from the declaration to inspire the country to go to war. And though he didn't go to war because he suddenly had an epiphany about the humanity of black people, he recognized it was in the nation's interest to be a union and that the only way that was going to happen is if slavery was abolished. But in order to make the case for a civil war, he used the language of the declaration. When Martin Luther King made the case for a more egalitarian, racially equitable society, he used the language of the Declaration and the Constitution in the I Have a Dream speech, which both sides cite ad nauseum now. So <laughs> the fact that the author of the National Anthem was not a good American, and certainly in the sense that if we're talking about ideals, doesn't mean that the words or the ideas inscribed, at least in the first verse, don't have application. He does you know, sort of veer off path a little bit. So what, what I say is um, we get to redefine the things that bring us together, and the National Anthem can be divisive but only if we say so. It can also be unifying. The best rendition of the national anthem, in my opinion, ever sung was Whitney Houston in 1991, a black woman, part of the great migration out of the South who grew up in New Jersey during war, when the United States is at war in Iraq, singing at the Super Bowl, the most beautiful rendition. And it had to be a black woman from a deep South church in her upbringing in a American flag tracksuit at frankly, a very civilly religious uh, venue in the Super Bowl at a time <laughs> of war singing the national anthem. And if that doesn't give you, like if that doesn't show you that this thing can be inclusive, then, um, then we're focusing too much on the thing and not on the message. Uh, so what can we do? The first thing is um, racism right now is being described no matter what we're talking, institutional racism, systemic racism, structural racism is all about hatred. So when people say is the United States racist, they were asking, does America hate black people? Does the United States hate black people? And I would say, no, the United States doesn't have the capacity to hate. It has the capacity to like implement policy that is intentionally discriminatory. And it's sometimes, and especially in institutions like slavery or in the Native American, um, you know, forcibly remove, removing them from land, it can be lethal. But uh, the institution, the state itself is about its interests, not about right, wrong, good, bad, love, hate. So, um, we have to think of racism as the, the, the product of the structures in our society that mean two people who are otherwise similarly situated except for their race or ethnicity have very different experiences for no other reason than the way our society is structured. And for the lack of protection one side gets and the benefits and privileges the other side gets. And if we think about it as a crime of the state, which is an argument I also make in the book and not yeah, as the do. bickering that happens between groups, then we can pull away from you're responsible for making my life easier as we attack one another to the state is responsible for not sufficiently addressing the things that mean me and my group don't have the same level of access to equality, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness as others. And then the, the final sort of trick here is to get everyone to recognize that the persistence of racism harms everyone. There is a reason that white men, especially in rural America, are the fastest growing rate of suicides in the country. 
Uh, it's, there's a reason that the opioid crisis hit white communities much harder than communities of color initially. Um, this isn't economic anxiety alone. This is a group of people who have been harmed by bad policy decisions and have been sold those policy decisions um, on the backs of those those other people of color who are stealing from the state, who are cutting in line, who are lazy and using up social safety net resources. That's the reason for your, your anxiety. Um, it's that kind of divert, that uh, divisive rhetoric that, that is, is causing a lot of our issues. Um, I, you know, I, I, there's like so much I wanna say about this, but in a sentence, transformative leaders are required to help pull us out of the muck. And right now we've got leaders who are more interested in keeping us divided and, and then winning elections instead of leaders that are willing to pull us together. And uh, even if it means losing uh, on policy battles, but the end result is a more united country. I guarantee you that uh, after your book tour, you're, you're gonna get the question often at the end that says, well, are you gonna run for office? But I'm gonna hold that. <laughs> I wanna hold that because I wanna come, I wanna, I wanna shift gears again a little bit. There's a question uh, that, I, that I also wanted to ask about Going back to the personal and the political, because one of the things that makes this book so powerful is the way you, you draw on your own story. And the opening line I had written that I was 12 years old the first time someone called me the N-word. Mm -hmm. So talk about how, how you, first of all, how you came to want to tell your own story and to weave it together and how you see the counterpoint between your own story. I mean, that's an amazing opening line for a book that is deeply patriotic and deeply right, about right. the value, the promise of America. That's probably not the opening line many would expect. So just talk a little bit about that. And then we do have a couple more on, on sort of the national issues. Okay. Yeah. So look, some of it was unavoidable. Um, you know, the book, the byline is Theodore R. Johnson, but my full name is Theodore Roosevelt Johnson III. And I was named after my father, who was named after his father. Uh, my grandfather was named after President Teddy Roosevelt, um, when in 1901, Teddy Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to the White House for dinner. It was the first time ever a black man had been invited to dine with the sitting president. Uh, Frederick Douglass had visited Abraham Lincoln, but through the back door, talked politics, and then sort of out the back door, Washington sat at the dinner table, which is a symbolizes um, racial equality. And the nation received it very differently. Lots of white Southerners were really upset, but lots mm -hmm. of black Southerners were inspired. And my great grandparents were so inspired that they named their third son after the rich white New Yorker Republican president and not the Southern black educator, Booker T. Washington, almost as a claim like a, 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 and to expose the hypocrisy. You know, uh, yeah. my child is an American and should have just as much chance of becoming president someday as anyone else, but by uh, but because of his skin, this will probably never happen. And yet they claimed some of the symboliz symbolism from the dinner for their family and the, their, this sort of tracks throughout the book. So the, the point in bringing in the family narrative from my enslaved great, great, great grandfather um, all the way through to today is to show that as I make these arguments about superlative citizenship or social solidarity or civil religion, that these aren't just theoretical concepts that if in a perfect environment, in a vacuum, if we put them just right and the light hits it just right, then we'll get a prism of national solidarity that just that shines through the country. It's to show the real and tangible impacts of bad policy, of bad leadership, of those moments when we could have made better choices, what happens to the people? Mm -hmm. And my sharecropping grandparents on both sides suffered under Jim Crow. My, I have enslaved, you know, on my mother's side, um, the first record I could find was of an eight-year-old black boy with no name, just the property of a family, um, you know, in Bluffton, Georgia. And this, this isn't an abstract occurrence. Uh, this is my family story. And so in, in this way, I hope that the family narrative would build out and allow some of the historical analysis and some of the theoretical ideas and, and constructs that are presented that will put some meat on those bones and, and put a face and a name and an experience to the ideas so that we can see both the challenges and where we've fallen short, but also the promise. Uh, these, my family, like many American families, still believed, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that the nation would be better for their children than it was for themselves. And, uh, and you know, I am 
happier to be, I am happy to be a black man in 2021 than in 1921 or certainly than in 1821. So while it's important to understand the black American experience in 1821, it's also important to acknowledge all of the suffering and sacrificing blood, sweat and tears that happened over the last four centuries that allowed us to progress um, without getting stuck in the history or without you know, sort of uh, patting ourselves on the back and only acknowledging the progress. That, that uh, one of my questions was going to be, what keeps you optimistic? But you've you've answered that. So we <laughs> we have a, a another another question. But one thing I I want to highlight because I you know I on one side I come from people who, who slaveholders from the old South, uh, mm. and you know the Southerners are fixated on family. You know my grandmother could trace back. You know and she could tell you. Who, generations of our own family and how we were related to everybody else. And really, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that only within the last five years have I fully realized the deep inequity that, of course, it's hard for you to find those records, as you said, mm, right? That's, that right? That's one of the great divides if you are a, a uh, black American who comes from enslaved Americans, your records are going to stop if you That's can right. find them. And it's something that white Americans take for granted that you're going to be able to trace. You know, I'll think about all the genealogy programs, et cetera. And it's so, so it's, it's a, it's yours is a powerful story, but it, it, to me, as I hear it, it also highlights exactly one of those huge differences that is the result of racism right. um, that I think many white Americans are, were until recently oblivious to. So it's, it was a particularly powerful part. You know, I sort of, want, we, you know, with DNA testing, we'll all find how interconnected we are, That's but right. we, can't, we can't trace it. Trace it. Um, so there's one more, oh. one more question. And then, uh, and, and if anybody else has, We've got, probably got time for two more, but here's a, here's a quite specific one. Um, uh, uh, Anthony Hayner, who's uh, very much looking forward to reading the book. That's good. <laughs> but who asked you specifically about, uh, do you talk about uh, narrowing or eliminating the educational gaps? Do you think about in the book, do you talk more specifically about uh, you know, policies that would result from greater national solidarity? Um, I'm not, not really. So I hint at, actually, I, I call out explicitly the range of racial disparities across different socioeconomic factors, wealth, pay, employment, education, housing, healthcare, on and on. Um, but the book is mostly about how, what are the policies that can help us uh, create national solidarity, that can uh, create conditions conducive to the to a, a the um, a rising of national solidarity, and the the five things I propose at the end of the book. One is democracy reform, which is about you know getting you know stopping gerrymandering and protecting people's voting rights and getting dark money out of politics, that sort of thing. The second though is civic education. So in this way, I do bring education in, but it's not education via like math, science, English kinds of things. It's how to be a better citizen. And it's beyond how many branches of government are there, do you know who your congressperson is, but do you know how to be a productive citizen in a constitutional you know, liberal democracy? And we, our skills are sorely lacking because we're not taught how to be good citizens. We're just taught to pay your taxes, obey the law, and you know, good neighbors make, or good fences make good neighbors, and that's sort of like the, the sum of the lessons there. Um, I talk a little bit about the need for deliberative democracy to bring mm -hmm. sort of compel citizens to be part of the democratic process beyond just voting, but the, the deliberations that happen and the decisions that come out of it. And again, the need for national service so that we can uh, get to know one another in these superordinate projects uh, and, and a mission that is bigger than the both of us so that we can create these connections. And then the fifth thing is transformative leadership, which I've already talked a little bit about. So um, the, the thinking for me though is if we do these things, then even if we never pass another piece of legislation on education, because we will be in solidarity with one another, we will ensure the existing system delivers on the things that are important to us, like equality and, and fairness and justice, even if the law doesn't mandate it be so. And, and where there are gaps and where there are people that try to exploit vulnerabilities, then we'll have a government that's responsive to us to plug those things. So it's kind of like um, we can't legislate ourselves into national solidarity. We can't uh, uh, address 
gaps in specific disciplines and then hope the the outcome of that is solidarity kind of have to find solidarity alongside the fights for fairness and justice and equality in these uh, different institutions including education that's wonderful so i'm going to just ask a last question and we will close it up uh, but as i hear you i also think you know real solidarity to go back to your point about seeing one another as humans means looking at you know black kids or kids of color uh, or for that matter poor white kids who are who, who show tremendous uh, educational disparities and not seeing their color just seeing talent that we are leaving behind to me that is, I, I look at look at you know if you assume that the talent is distributed equally an opportunity is not which we we have to assume I just you think what? What extraordinary cost that is to all of us uh, that we are we are leaving that talent behind and that we are not living up to our ideals that every human being ought to be able to get as far as his or her uh, potential can take them. So here's my final question. Everybody listening, everybody listening in all the talks you're going to be giving goes out and buys your book, which we absolutely want them to do and reads it cover to cover and is totally inspired. What do they do next? Yeah, it's it's uh, so. Um, the first truth I think is that change in this country is not going to come from top down. It's not going to be we elect some president or we get some very charismatic leaders in Congress that then teach us how to be better and we all follow their example and, and walk up to the sunset together. I think the America that we all want is going to bubble up from the bottom, from localities, communities, and force change to happen national, at the state level and nationally. Um, so that means the, the way, the, the actions we have to take to create this national solidarity begin with our social circles and, our, and in our neighborhoods and communities. And the thing we can do individually is to kind of be the superlative citizen, you know, to kind of practice the excellencies of citizenship. Um, not in terms of tax paying, though pay your taxes, not in terms of, of military service or law and order, but um, how you treat uh, your, your neighbors, your fellow man, and when they are treated um, unfairly, uh, when their rights are infringed upon, are you, is it not your problem and you go about your life? Or do, are you willing to ensure that the problem they're facing um, is not one that will eventually reach you because you fail to, to acknowledge it. The, the biggest one thing I would say though, if, if there was just one thing I would ask people to do is to proactively meet other people who are not in your circle presently. Go to restaurants that, that are 90% black if you're white or go to you know, the soccer club or the, 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 the yoga thing or whatever, find places where you are not in the majority, where people like you are not in the majority, and 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 take residence there. You know, don't take it over, don't try to change it, but get in those spaces where um, where you are forced to confront difference, uh, so that you can see just how much uh, similarities there are. It won't be easy, um, but if it was easy, we my book wouldn't be necessary. We would have already conquered the thing. It will be difficult, but it, it, it solidarity again requires sacrifice and it also requires forbearance by white Americans, black Americans, Americans of every race and ethnicity, no one gets off the hook easily. And, uh, and so we're all gonna have to, to step up to the plate. If freedom really isn't free, this is the cost that we have to pay. There's no better way to end than that. Um, so Ted, thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you for writing a wonderful book. Uh, thanks to everybody in the audience uh, for listening and for giving us your questions. Uh, again, it's a wonderful book. I urge you to buy it and read it and tell your friends about it. Uh, and finally, thanks to the New America Fellows Program, uh, both for supporting Ted to write this book, but also uh, for working with the New America Events staff to put on a wonderful event. So thanks to everyone. Thank you.